Well, welcome yeah. everybody to another episode of Altered Attitudes. We're here in sunny, it's actually sunny, lowest off today at Harmony House, which is a new project by the Adam Outreach Project that uh, Ricky's the manager of. So we've invited him on today to tell us a bit about the uh, Adam Outreach Project, about the new project in Harmony House, but also about himself. He's been in recovery. He's a recovery success story on many levels. <laughs> and uh, so it'd just be good. I think Ricky B is just nice to start off telling us a bit about your background. Yeah. And kind of what led you into recovery and up to this point. Yeah, certainly. Thank you, Lester, for inviting me today. Um, so I suppose looking back, um, <clears throat> you know, it was... Um, Addiction kind of robbed a lot of my life, a lot of my childhood, a lot of my teenage years, and um, certainly a lot of my adulthood. Um, and, you know, I think, like, when we talk about addiction, we think about disconnection. And I think I was massively disconnected from myself and society as a whole. And, um, and over the years, um, you know, as we know, addiction is a disease of the mind. It's an illness centred in your mind. Um, and that's what I've come to believe, that it's an illness centred in my mind. Um, and without a programme and without arresting this condition, it's progressive over time, isn't it? And I think when I look back, I can see how progressive it was. And um, Riggy, I've got, I've got to yeah. ask this, because again, I am um, got an mm. interest in kind of dysfunction and yeah. stuff like that. And it's not everybody's story yeah. in addiction. I don't believe it's what causes addiction. No. But what was your childhood kind of like? So yeah, you went down quite a rocky road I did, with crime yeah. and that kind of thing. Probably a little bit more than just drinking and yeah. drugs. There was a lot of other element to it. Yeah. yeah, absolutely. Yeah. So looking back to my childhood, you know, there was a lot of um, broken relationships with my dad. My dad left my mum at an early age. There was violence in the home. Me and my brothers got knocked about by my mum's partner at the time, who was an alcoholic. So I witnessed some trauma at the age of nine. And like you said, rightly so, I believe that addiction um, isn't the root, uh, trauma isn't the root cause of addiction, but I think certainly that triggers off a chain of events where it can affect your self-esteem, your mental health, your security, your ambitions. And I think looking back at my childhood, I had no nurturing environment. There wasn't a dad figure to look up to, so there was no role models in my life. I think my mum done her best, bless her heart, you know, and, and you know, as a testimony to the 12 step program, my relationship with my mum is, is, you know, amazing today. Um, but certainly looking back, you know, my childhood was, yeah, there was a lot of trauma involved. Um, um, there was, you know, my schooling was going well until I got to about 11 and I, and I started to get expelled. I started to act out in class, things like that. And, um, and my behaviour started going wayward from a very young age. I started committing low-level crimes, shop thefts. Which area like was you brought up in? Oh, I'm from Brentwood, Essex. Was that kind of that, like that? Is that a social kind of, were all the other kids kind of behaving that way? So, so no, I mean, where I grew up, before my dad left, you know, I had a very good, stable childhood up to nine. My dad managed my football team. We lived in a very um, desirable part in Essex, in Brentwood, which was down a... Kind of, you know, on a nice house, a nice road, um, a nice part of Brentwood. Brentwood's a, a nice area, you know. But um, I think for me, like, it wouldn't take a lot for me back then when I look back for someone to say, have you ever tried drugs? Have you ever tried this? And I was kind of naturally drawn to the older generation, you know, acting out. Um, I think the first time someone said, you know, about um, going to commit crime, there was something in me that was kind of attracted to that darkness, attracted to that behaviour. And um, and I don't blame my parents at all. You know, when I look back, I can see that, um, you know, I was, um, I had my own issues, of course. Um, but I think the environment that I was in certainly had a part to play in my upbringing and, and how that affected my psyche. And, um, you know, that nature nurture that we know about, I started to, um, you know, act out, mm. yeah. And it was um, it was painful when I look back. It was, but I didn't have a sponsor. I didn't have someone to sit down with. So I guess your dad leaving home that was like that was a major turning point in your life. Yeah. Do you remember how you felt? What were how you? What was going on inside you? Yeah, definitely. I felt disconnected. Um, did I, you see it coming? Did you? Or was not it just really. No, on you? it just suddenly happened. My dad left me. Mum. 
obviously, you know, I think that's for another podcast maybe, but cut a long story short, my dad um, went off to Hampshire um, for a career move and their relationship started to break down. My dad was turning up and then he stopped turning up and then until one day, you know, I knew that my dad weren't coming back. And I think, you know, that abandonment and that rejection um, and not having the things that other people had, you know, like my friends at school, they had all the designer clothes, the shoes that was going on, the holidays, you know, that I could see that they had that love in their life. And I think for me, that was missing. I didn't feel loved or wanted. And I think that abandonment can play out in people's lives, especially when you're an addict of my variety and how that can cause a lot of destruction, if not, not dealt with. Yeah. Mm. And so where did that... So when did you sort of start drugs and alcohol? So uh, <laughs> when I look back, it was like, it was definitely like experiential, cannabis, you know, things like that, speed, pills, going on at raving, um, and, you know, experimenting in those drugs, you know, hallucinogenics, um, cannabis really destroyed my mental health from a young age. I can remember kind of feeling quite paranoid around people. I'd walk down the street, if I'd smoked a spliff, I'd start feeling on edge, but... My mind would tell me, oh, I'll have one, you feel all right. And the insanity was that I never did. It made me feel worse. Mm. Um, I can remember going to my GP at a young age and the doctor prescribing me diazepam at 15. And I remember feeling like really content when I took one. And, um, and, I, and I hadn't tried any other methods, but um, it was encouraged that I took two milligrams a day. So before I'd even left high school, I was hooked on diazepam. But it went, so, so would you sort of say that, because you kind of get this idea <laughs> that some people are like, oh, I feel a little bit like less than, a little bit unloved, so I'm going to go and use drugs. Yeah. Or would you just try and have a good time and I think get involved the, what's going on? And Yeah, I think definitely, like I said, there was no role models in my life. And again, I didn't have much guidance and direction. You know, like your dad sort of is there to, to show you how to shave, tie your shoes up you know, um, cut wood, life skills, you know, show you how to manage finances, all them things. And I think that played a huge part. But I think, you know, there was a part of me that enjoyed it. I enjoyed taking drugs. I enjoyed what it did. Um, It helped me to escape reality. Again, I didn't know how progressive it would be. So I can remember at about 16, 17, um, my mum took me to this, I was trying to do some uh, college work And I was training to be a plumber at the time. And I think that was probably the most successful I'd ever got trying to do a plumbing course whilst being an addict, but not knowing I was an addict in this progressive condition. And my mum took me and I remember seeing these um, down and out street addicts on the street. And they were clearly heroin addicts. I now can remember what they looked like, but didn't know them. But I can remember thinking I'll never turn out like them. I remember thinking I'll never end up like them. And at that time, I was just starting to experiment with cocaine um, until it started to become more progressive onto the heroin and the crack cocaine. And um, and I became that person. I became the people that I never in a million years thought I'd become. And at the age of 18, you know, I'm waking up sweating. I've got the shakes. My head's pounding. I'm, my, my bed is drenched. And um, and I remember being told, Ricky, you're, you're addicted to heroin. And that was it. I remember it clearly. I was 18 years old. And it got really dark quickly. My life spiralled and prison sentences come, you know, and that was like a, a common occurrence. I'm up and down the police station now. I'm a prolific offender. You know, that's when my, my behaviours went wayward. And so the consequences got worse, but I didn't care at the time. And um, and obviously I weren't conscious, so I, I didn't care. And I hurt a lot of people around me. I'd become a drain to society. The community couldn't stand me. The police couldn't stand me. I couldn't stand me myself. I was in a lot of pain, but not knowing how was to get angry? out of it. Was you angry? Was you angry person? I was angry at everything. I was angry at myself, but I couldn't work out why I was the way I was. I thought I was just... I thought I was just gonna, I was destined to, I thought I was destined to die in that way. I thought there was someone like me. I thought the book says, Big Book of Alcoholics Anonymous says there, there are these such unfortunates. They're not fault. They seem to have been born that way. They're naturally incapable of grasping a man of living which demands rigorous honesty. I thought I was of that variety. Um, and I never in a million years thought that there was a way out and there was people in recovery that had, that had turned a corner and got clean and sober. And more than that, becoming productive members of society. I never thought that was tangible. 
Definitely not. So what changed? What changed? Um, again, it was a lot of pain, you know, pain. I was in a lot of pain and I lost my dad 10 years ago and he, he my dad was an alcoholic. He didn't know he was an alcoholic and, and me and my dad's relationship was really, really unhealthy. It was toxic, you know. Um, my dad had a breakdown in about 2009 um, he split up with, um, he remarried when he left my mum, he remarried a woman called Tracy in Hampshire. And um, and he was successful, he was a really successful man, good looking, handsome, courageous. You know, he had a, a lot of good attributes about him, but he would pick up a drink and he couldn't stop. And when I look back, I can see how his low self-esteem, his depression used to get him, his mental health would decline, he couldn't keep you our contact. He seemed to be erratic all over the place. Looking back, I can see that now. And um, and for my dad, he moved, um, when his relationship broke down, he moved to uh, back to Brentwood. And that's when the, the tables turned for me, when I started drinking with my dad. So we started to form this really unhealthy relationship. I would go up the road and get his alcohol and I'd come back and we'd drink together. Um, and then I'd start stealing off of him. So it was like a long chain of this dysfunction. And of course, you know, the, the shame and the guilt of that meant for more drinking and more using. And we just built this really toxic relationship. And, um, and fast forward the tapes, you know, my dad sadly died as a result of his lifestyle of alcoholism. Although he did draw a sober breath towards the end, <coughs> he had a, um, a metal stent put in his chest because he did have developed COPD. I mean, he'd smoke like a chimney, drink, smoke, drink, smoke. His teeth were like sweet corn, you know, they were, they were really bad. His health was massively declining. One, some days I'd turn up, I think the most horrendous time I'd seen my dad was um, all the lights had gone off and there was a flood in his front room and he was sat in his own shit and piss. And there was bo empty bottles of gin around him. And at the time I was so desensitized myself that my first thought was, you know, what can I get out of this place? What can I get? Rather than care and, you know, alarmingly be distressed that my dad's killing himself. And of course, after I got what I wanted, I'd make phone calls. And my dad had lots of interventions. I never, you know, I kept going. But I've, the help went on to my dad. He ended up being um, put, in, put into a mental health institution, which is for people that, you know, um, they've lacked mental capacity. So there was little bits of intervention, but sadly that never worked. And, and like I said, my dad sadly died, you know, as a result of alcoholism. And I found him dead. The police were there and I, I witnessed my dad on the floor. And that was in 2014. And by this stage, you know, my, my using was really progressive. Like I said, in and out of prison. There was a lot of pain. There was a lot of mental torture. I felt really tormented, but didn't understand the way out, you know. And there was a lot of tears. There was a lot of a lot of um, issues going on. And um, and I think, like, I had a breakdown after that, but I didn't know I was having one, but I suffered. from that moment, I think PTSD became prevalent and the, the image of my dad dead on the floor was just burnt into my consciousness. And if I'd shut my eyes, I'd see it. If I opened my eyes, I would, I'd see him on the floor. But I didn't know that I was suffering from that and I was just doing a lot of heroin at this stage and a lot of crack, which caused me massive amounts of psychosis. Um, the diazepam was extreme use. Now I'm drinking special brew. I'm just trying to shut my own head up in reality. I'm trying to just escape this torture. I'm like hell on earth. I think if there was a hell on earth, I was in that. I was in it. And, um, and uh, I went on a wild spree and I ended up getting chased by helicopters. I ended up on Crime Watch in 2014. Um, sorry, 2013. And I ended up getting arrested and I went, went into prison for the last time. And, um, and this time, I, something was happening in my soul and I was in HMP Penterville and I was in this cell and this light came through this window. It was like the sun coming up and um, it illuminated the cell and there was all blood on the walls, wax and toenails and other people's socks and cobwebs and old milk cartons at the window. I mean, it was horrific, you know, and I just remember feeling... I want to die, I don't want to be here, I've, I've had enough. And I remember in my soul, something just took out, I fell on my knees and I just cried. And I said, I said a prayer for the first time, I cried out to a higher power and I said, please help me, someone help me, you know. And, um, and that set off a chain of events where doors started opening. And, um, 
until an intervention took place and uh, a kind lady that was like an angel in my life um, who was in AA and I now talk to her, bless her heart, she's like 17 years sober. Um, she got me funding and got me funding in for rehab. I'd never heard of the 12-step program, didn't understand it, um, didn't really identify I needed it. You know, as we know, this illness, it lies to you and it, it's progressive, you know, over the time. And, um, and I think I was in so much pain and torment that I was willing to go through whatever I had to go through. Of course, you know, we kick and scream when we come in the door, our ego rebuilds, that's another story. But thank God there was intervention and I got into the place that you use the director of East Coast Recovery and I came out of prison in 2015, January. I got a car ride, I'm not gonna admit, sorry, I'm gonna admit that the car ride, I got them to stop, drunk some booze on the way, you know, and the woman was like, oh no, this bloke's now drunk. Um, and that was my sort of um, introduction to getting into rehab. I think that was just that brokenness again. And But I got into rehab, you know, finally I got into your environment that you, you're the director of and that environment which there's other people in there with lived experience that understand me but could love me and nurture me and guide me and that is what I needed. I needed that environment. But that environment, <clears throat> it don't appear to work for everybody. What do you mm. think was it about that environment that worked for you? I think it's, I think the, the, the environment of having people in there that could understand you and give you a safe space to be able to, to come undone, to, to peel their onion layers back and get to the root causes of why I am the way I am, you know, why I do the things I do, why I keep acting out, why I keep taking drugs. And I think that your rehab helped me understand what I suffer from, you know, that I suffer from the disease of addiction. And that, that diagnosis through that AA doctor's opinion helped save my life. And I never knew what was wrong with me. I, I kept bouncing in and out of all these other, um, you know, like recovery, um, services like your drug and alcohol services that have the ethos of harm reduction that never worked for me i just got worse never better um but i think your pro your rehab it introduced me to a way of life and a program which arrested this condition yeah i hear that a lot from people is that what they say is because they've been in a lot of other people been in other rehabs but what they found most useful and important about our one was was to how well we understood addiction and could mm. explain it to people. Absolutely. So you could see what was yeah. happening to you. And the brain as well. You know, you, you used to do your groups. I remember when I first met you and you'd done the group about neuro-linguistic reprogramming and programming and you spoke about the addict brain. And that was like revolutionary to someone like me. When you broke that down, it just made sense. And I think the art of your... Your rehab really helped someone that was lost like me and hurt and damaged, helped me to understand me. And that was the gift. How long know? did you stay in it for? I was here for nearly a year. Yeah. And, I, and I needed it. That makes it. a difference, doesn't it? I've Absolutely. Because now it's very difficult to get. Well, they didn't fund for that long. They only would fund for uh, six months back then. We had to uh, find other ways to make the money for yeah. the rest of the time. But... But that long time, that long period is kind of needed, isn't it? Absolutely. I for think, some people. Yeah, for some people. I think, look, I remember back in treatment and you, you would have your, you'd have like an alcoholic that would, that would obviously, there was a lot of pain there. But, you know, after a few weeks, the light was, would come on, you know, the lights would come on and they'd be able to talk. They'd be able to connect to their voice. They'd be able to connect to their emotions through their step work. They'd become like uh, approachable, you know, they would have these elements of their cells where you could see that they're ready to go. Me three weeks in, I'm still bonkers. You know, I am i can't have conversations. I'm erratic, I'm antisocial, um, I'm very manipulative, I'm dishonest, I'm still really selfish. I think I know best still. So with me, I needed that environment to chip away at all them parts of it. Was it really challenging? Absolutely. No, challenger. I, I needed challenging. <laughs> <laughs> I needed telling straight as well. And in love, but sometimes you do need to be told the truth because the truth sets us free, doesn't it? Yeah. And I think that, look, you can comfort someone with lies, but they ain't going to help them. And I think for someone like me, I needed to be yeah, sat Yeah, because the truth's real. The truth's real. That's yeah. The, thing, the lies are not. The lies are not. And as bitter as, the, as, as that 
bitterness taste, that pill to swallow taste bitter, it starts to develop a seed in us that helps us to grow and develop. And I think it's that truth and that honesty, that gut level, level honesty in yourself. And then seeing the carnage you've caused as well, waking up to the people you've hurt and yeah, being conscious of Because I think the difference is, and you can probably understand, is that before you reach that level of consciousness, mm. like how long did you want to change before you actually changed? I think there was always a part of me that wanted to change. But it didn't know how. But I didn't know and that's how. that's the thing. So yeah. it's kind of like you, you're not even free doing what, what you want. And then I think no. when you actually then come into that recovery program that's got mm. a good understanding of that, you get to be able to take control of yourself. Yeah. But then you can start directing yourself yeah. in the direction that you're more comfortable to go in and again we need a lot yeah. of help at the beginning to Absolutely, do that Absolutely, yeah. because again i think that's the contract that, that we sort of had with people it's mm. like look if you want what we got and you're willing to do what we do then you can stay here if you don't yeah. want to do this that's fine we don't want to take away your freedom but go somewhere go else somewhere else then that's spot on and that's exactly the same mindset i have now when i help people and again you know not everyone responds to the 12 step program and i think it's because it says it works if you work it it don't if you don't and i think people can jump off before that miracle happens because of the discomfort because well, i think about that thinking about it, it's like all it really is is that it's a tool Mm. it's a tool that helps you get that autonomous or mm. autonomy that personal freedom that i can choose yeah you know how i want to live my life in the way that i want to live it even if that means for me that i give that to a philosophy or an idea i'm doing that because i want to mm. not even because i have to but because exactly. because i want to then i can live the life that i feel is fit for me to live because exactly. i have that because that's the difference between being powerless means your life's unmanageable yeah. you can't manage your own life yeah power then that gives me the ability to start mm. managing and directing taking responsibility taking responsibility mm. to and end up where i want to go rather than bouncing around Mm. all over the world in places that I don't want to go with people I don't want to be with yeah I mean you might have the same thing it's like yeah. how many friends do you have that you hated fair weathered it's friends like they're yeah. not even my friends but I've got no choice because yeah. I need something from them mm. and you end up in this whole life that you just don't want but you yeah. can't get out of well it's like a, a it's like a addiction's like a prison but the more you use the more the more them them bars are shut in and you think you're escaping reality, but you're not. You're getting relief. And I think yeah. recovery is about release. 12-step recovery gives you release and it unlocks that door, you know, the addiction. Yeah. So so on that basis then, so after a year in rehab, mm. somewhat you got the choice back yeah. in your life. Yeah. You know, what did you then, what did you use it for? What did you decide to do? I think uh, I went on an educational journey, you know, I didn't really know what I wanted to do, but I, I could see that being around East Coast Recovery and coming back volunteering, taking meetings, being a secretary of the man's meeting, which you used to hold next door in Albany, and then in here there'd be the women's meeting, and just being around the others. I think I needed people around me. I, I, I just didn't trust myself still. I needed that. You know, like this was like a lifeboat for me, you know, and I think that being around people that needed support and someone like me was like a peer mentor, it gave me purpose, gave me direction, it gave me something that I could focus on. And I think like coming back in here and being a peer mentor gave me something to do, like routine, stability, um, and it, and it helped me, you know, I'd wake up in the morning, I'd started to work this 12 step program and I could see that I had something to do today. So I'd go out knowing that I'm coming here. And I think that's so important for people because when you've got a lot of time on your hands, especially someone like me that's new in, um, you know, your mind can start playing tricks. And if you've not got a good support network around you, um, then you're probably going to start going back to old devices. And I see people that move out of these environments for the first six weeks. It's like the biggest crucial part of their journey is that that segment of time they could relapse. And I've witnessed that myself. And I remember East Coast Recovery saying, Ricky, you really need to come back. You need to come back in, stay connected. 
And um, and for me, like, I started to realise something in me, like, I started to see that when I speak with other people suffering, back then I realised that it did something for me, it alleviated self, it alleviated a part of me where I was trying to escape myself, you know, and it was, but helping someone else helped me back then, you know, like you say, um, I used to help people to get out of self, but now I help people because I'm out of self, but back then I needed people to get out of self. So, um, and then being around other other people and like yourself, being around other people that are developed, that helped develop me. And being around this environment helped me to see the other staff members, how they worked, how they become support workers. And um, yeah, I think, you know, you put up with me for a while, you know, and you, you know, I think like when I look back, I can see that this environment really fostered my recovery, helped foster recovery, it helped forge that recovery capital in me and gave me enough tools to be able to then um, become a support worker. You know, you put me through that level three, which I'm like, eternally grateful for. That gave me, you know, education, which I never had. Um, and uh, gave me that sort of nurturing that I needed, you know, and that, and that space and that love that I needed that I never had before. And I think that's what I felt, you know, I felt that love and that compassion for someone like me with dealing with myself in this world is, is quite hard work. And it can be today, but back then, you know, I really needed that that um, mentoring. And I think that's important for someone like myself and people that have definitely been in the grips of addiction, that they need discipline, they need mentoring, they need nurturing. Yeah. yeah. And then I think you had a bit of a stint after all that as a plumber. Yeah. And then I think you worked then just stayed in the care industry didn't that's you, right. for a while. Yeah, the plumbing was kind of a bit of an amends, I suppose, to... My dad, you know, when my dad, before my dad died, I remember having a conversation with him and it went on the lines of, my dad said, you need to sort your life out. And I remember saying, I will. And I remember thinking, I'm going to do plumbing. So I think that was a part of my amends to myself that I was going to finish that level two off. And I went and done it. And um, But again, you know, a closed door is a redirection. And I always knew deep down that my story had a lot of wet, um, had a lot of depth and weight to it, and I could help people with that story, and um, and so yeah, I came back to East Coast Recovery and trained up as a support worker, and I absolutely loved it. I loved it. I can remember doing the detoxes here and supporting people through the detox stages, and then mentoring them all the way through to graduation, and and being a witness to that, it was fantastic, enlightening, you know. Um, it's not for the faint hearted, as you know, you know, mm. helping people is difficult and working with other addicts in this industry as well, people in recovery, that can also be tricky because you've got the mental health faculties with it. You know, people are still, um, you know, putting their lives back together. Um, but yeah, I always felt drawn to this sector. And, um, and as I've gone along, I've, I've realised that I've become more professional in my approaches. I've become more educated. Um, there's a lot of me that how I used to be, that how I'm not anymore. I've seen areas in myself that I've had to chip away at. Um, well, yeah. So then you become the manager of um, the Adam Outreach yeah. project. Mm. So it might be good to tell us a bit about what is the Adam Outreach project. Yeah. So Adam Outreach project, they've been established for nearly 18 years. Their um, their focus. Um, it was solely on homelessness so and all that that can entail. So any result in trauma of a breakdown of relationship, addiction, mental health, um, financial hardships, people coming out of prisons, um, people in, that are bouncing in and out of the services, drug and alcohol services, people coming out of rehabs that need that extra support. Um, the house was set up solely for making that service um, readily available for anybody that needed it. Um, and certainly what led me there, you know, there was a job application that went out into some local churches. It's a Christian organization. Um, and I was on my own educational journey with spirituality and I just felt my heart was pulled to that. Um, at the time I was on a mental health nursing degree. So I thought that that was where I wanted to go. Again, I was just testing the water, seeing where, what was coming up. And at the time I was working in a, in a homeless shelter, um, which again was um, a different ethos, more like a head on a bed sort of response to homelessness. And that was a really difficult place to work. Um, but this job come up and um, 
And I was just thought, you know, I'm going to go for it. Went and took the interview, and um, within an hour they phoned me and they said, "Do you want the job?" And um, <laughs> and I didn't know what it would entail. I didn't. Um, I was a fresh person in the door in managing. Um, I didn't have. I didn't definitely didn't uh, have all the skills, which was a disadvantage at the time. But I had a heart and a, a, to, for the industry, and I knew that if I could just apply myself and get educated on the job. Um, certainly um, it would come good and so I just went through a mass process of um, of um, the school of hard knocks I suppose <laughs> you know it was like a baptism of fire in there um, very difficult environment um, the people in there were let's just say untreated you know they weren't treated with what I'd been treated with for East Coast recovery yeah so that's the sort of thing about recovery yeah. is see recovery is a, I see recovery as a thing yeah and that you either have it or you don't mm. it's very misunderstood even people in recovery yeah it's a very misunderstood thing but i think if you've got it you can transmit it to other people not I'm, easily not it takes no, time it does yeah and they have to be sort of willing they have mm. to be at least 75 percent willing <laughs> yeah but it does take time to transmit it and show it and teach it Mm. And because it is so difficult and so misunderstood, yeah, um, I, I very much worked in them sort of places, mm. but I didn't like it because I didn't feel there was any treatment. No, there was not what I. Because again, being in recovery, I could see that there is a way out. Mm, absolutely, for some of them people, uh, and it wasn't being offered. So, mm. so how did you sort of find it in them environments for you? It was uh, it was difficult. There was um, there were some testing times of like you know when you're managing you have to re in start to implement new policies, new procedures, different responses to addiction. I suppose with knowing what I knew, I knew what worked as well. Um, I could see what works as well in the community, and so I suppose I started to just slowly um, change the culture over time, which weren't easy. You know, slowly embed changes. Um, started to develop the staff, giving them giving them a broad understanding of addiction, um, and then I suppose like you know slowly bringing in groups, twelve step groups, bringing in morning check in groups. Um, we adopted your model of that ten ten ten, which is absolutely fantastic way to start a day. You know, pausing, reflecting, reading something inspirational because there's you know as we know, an addict untreated is definitely not sitting in any kind of inspiration. And having like a good um, mindset, of thinking, what can I do today to be productive? Can I be kind to someone? Can I, can I do something? Maybe think about volunteering. You know, and I think that that morning ten 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 and that morning checking group for us, I, f I could see. I started to pilot it for thirty days to see what it would do. So we started doing it, and um, and slowly but surely, after a month, I started to feel the change in the project. I started to see some lights coming on, people started asking about recovery. And so what we done was we started to make this, um, this project timetable where we would start taking people to meetings, the one-to-one -one started to change, so that one-to-one -one key working change, we started to incorporate the 12-step program, started to talk a bit about CBT, again about the brain, I should do, you know, get the whiteboard out, which I love. And being that vision, you know, visionary and showing them, well, look, this is what happens when you use and this is what happens as well. When you come into recovery and you start applying the 12 steps, your brain starts to open up. You start to develop neural nets for recovery. And they were like, some of them were like, wow, not everyone was, no. you know. Um, but we started to take back the land, you know, we started to take back people's souls and their minds and started to get recovery in there. And the flag started to, to, to be waved. And, and over like the last course of four years, we've had a complete rebirth in the staff. My wife, Louise, who sadly couldn't be here today because my daughter's, um, she had to go into school. My wife's gone to some open day. But um, my wife now works there. Louise, she's in recovery. Um, all the support, support staff are in recovery. So we started to adapt that lived experience in the project. And because we understand them, I think that's, definitely speaks volumes for people when you understand someone and you say yeah and me i used to feel like that i'll get you you straight away that connection that connection happens doesn't it yeah because it's real yeah it's true exactly and so and about reach is um still very much sort of homeless support yeah. 
with a bit more and opportunity uh, yeah, for recovery. Definitely. So, and uh, so, but now you've overtaken, you've taken over Harmony House, which is a, uh, it's not yeah. open just yet. It's, no. But there's a new concept that's mm. developing. So, what is the idea for Harmony House? What's the concept here? So, I think like looking back at the experience and the wisdom of Adam Outreach, and then sort of um, combining my experience as well um, with the rest of the team um, and the trustees that are on board, is that we're kind of building this revolutionary guest house so we can build on recovery capital, like East Coast Recovery, but. I'd say less regimented as a rehab, um, you know, and certainly I think doors are opening where one day we may get there, you know, we may birth into that kind of full on ethos. It's not a rehab. No, not yet. It's going to be more relaxed approach. We're still going to be using those evidence based approaches at work. We're going to have an in-house chef. We're going to have hospitality team. So and who, who would come here then? Who can come here? So it will be post detoxing so we're not going to have nurses in here or people doing detoxes um, again because we don't we're not ready to be regulated in that way so we're going to be dealing with more of the brain the mind after the physical faculties have been dealt with we can then start to help focus on building recovery capital in here and um, introducing them to the 12-step model again introducing them to group work and exploring the brain and exploring these fundamental parts of ourselves and um, giving that safe environment for people to feel loved and you know nurture that part of them what they've lost through alcoholism and addiction and um, again this environment like yourself you spent a lot of money on this place and we've certainly invested a lot as well making it into like feeling like a home you know it, as you can see around you it's it's nice here it's we're just near the sea at the beach um I love this property. It feels so what, nice. What would it, so somebody come here, what would a day look like for them? So, um, again, it's like, you know, there's that routine involved. So they get up, there's going to be breakfast. There'll be all sorts of different breakfast opportunities and varieties there. Um, there'll be like a morning check-in groups. So they can come in and sit in and check in. Um, it, it's nothing that's going to be extreme you know it's going to be just a safe space for those to come down out of their rooms so when you say it's not so regimented it's just a little bit more relaxed more relaxed yeah a lot more relaxed more like coming from that retreat angle rebooting recharging not, not loads of therapy groups not loads or, of therapy but groups some. but some yeah we're going to have bolt on therapists um, that we're going to partner with as i say rehabs uk and other people that have, that are interested um, and again, it's like, um, you know, offering that support and, ele and and giving that same environment where people can build on their recovery. Um, so, yeah. so someone, say so somebody, they've done a home detox, but they, they want somewhere to go and stay for a week or a bump, yeah. just somewhere a little bit more relaxed that they can have some support. Yeah chill out feel a bit more comfortable be mm. around some people to look yeah. after them yeah or somebody that's sort of been in a rehab but it's quite expensive rehabs mm. Mm. that they could come to somewhere like this and spend yeah. a little bit longer you know in a relaxed environment you know doing certain amount of therapeutic work but mm. But sort of a cross between a rehab and a spa sort of thing. Yeah, we, we are very much like in the middle there, yeah. And, you know, like I said, they get the keys to their room. Um, it sort of feels like, I think we're trying to foster an environment where they don't feel like they're closed in as much, like the doors are all locked, you know. And again, we're going to have house rules and there's going to be some codes of conduct that they have to adhere to. But I think it's going to foster like a, a more relaxed approach, you know. Where, yeah, like, like a retreat. Yeah, really, absolutely. With, with a bit more support, but geared at people. Yeah, that just need a little bit more support, but not quite as much as a rehab or. Yeah. Um, so just a lot, you know, so just a lot more relaxed. Yeah. Uh, re retreat vibe. Definitely. You know, and I nice think nice walks. You know, Beach yep, absolutely yeah the beach the coast around here is fantastic as you dogs know dogs to walk dogs to walk of. yeah there's a lot you know there's um alton broad there's sand rivers in. and yeah rivers it's, it's so you can incorporate a lot of that outside into the absolutely we're partnering with people as we speak who are interested in supporting us to help create these therapeutic based activities to keep them busy and you know just just keep what sort of therapies 
um, those therapeutic based activities so mm. like going out connecting to nature you know walking talking that's a, a fascinating but it proves it works you know even going out walking and talking mm. it really helps people to connect doesn't it yeah well yeah. i just think i always found myself is that it's just sometimes people just need time yeah and because again your brain don't recover too quickly <laughs> no. and so uh, sometimes asking people to um to stop drugs and alcohol but then carry on with their lives it's a little bit too much to mm, ask and absolutely they might go and have a detox in like 14 days but you yeah. still got this red raw brain yeah, that exactly. probably does need a bit of cotton wool wrap around it mm. for a period of time the just mouth. just to give them <laughs> a bit more time to physically recover and yeah. find their feet again and, and again i i see a place like this that's uh, is essential mm, absolutely uh, to, to have that sort of that care retreat element but also the element of um people doing some helping you look at your look at yourself but not nothing too deep nothing too nothing major. too deep yeah exactly that and again there are avenues for that um that can be bolt-ons you know um but certainly not in-house um but yeah i think that this place is going to be, um, it's, it's unique, it's revolutionary because uh, it's a guest house as well. So it's, it's, it's something that I've not heard of it's before. It's kind of staying as a guest house. It's staying as a it? guest house, yeah. So it's kind of like a guest house with a bit more. With a bit more, <laughs> yeah. And it's really cost effective. So again, it's yeah. really unique. It's, yeah, we believe it's going to be a fantastic uh, service for people. Yeah, and uh, so you've got a website so we can put some links at yeah. the end for that yeah we've got, got a website developing being developed right now we've got a current website which you can download there's a brochure on it we've got an email we can send um you can send us your your information to our information email and we can forward you things and talk about pricing and what we offer here and the food and what you can bring what you can't you know all those questions that you have before you come in these environments we can hopefully answer them as well yeah, it's a lovely place, Lower Stoft. I always yeah. enjoyed the, uh, we used to call it positive recreational activities, like yeah. canoeing on the beach and South Ward and yeah. swimming in the river and, you know. Uh, Cold water therapy, if you like that thing. Well, wow, it's nice, especially <laughs> yeah. in the summer. But mm. um, anyway, I think that sort of brings that bit to an end. I think we need to do yeah. more with you and Louise at some point about your recovery and talking about your kids and. Mm. you know how your life's developed wow and, uh, yeah. at some point but i think that brings us to the end of this point today it's a thank lovely you. house and uh thank you very much for letting us in yeah thank, thank you, you for being here thank you